14 Sunday after Pentecost. Epistle of St. Paul the Apostle to the Galatians. Brethren, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are contrary one to another, so that you do not the things that you would. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are fornication, uncleanness, immodesty, luxury, idolatry, witchcrafts, enmities, contentions, emulations, wraths, quarrels, dissensions, sects, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I foretold you, and as I have foretold to you, that they who do such things shall not obtain the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is charity, joy, peace, patience, benignity, goodness, longanimity, mildness, faith, modesty, continency, chastity. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified their flesh with the vices and concupiscences. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will sustain the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, be not solicitous for your life, what you shall eat, nor for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than the meat, and the body more than the raiment? Behold the birds of the air, for they neither sow, nor do they reap, nor gather into barns, and your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not of much more value than they? And which of you can, which of you by taking thought can add to his stature one cubit? And for raiment, why are you solicitous? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They labor not, neither, neither do they spin. But I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed as one of these. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more you? O ye of little faith. Be not solicitous, therefore, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the heathen seek. For your Father knoweth that you have need of the, all these things. Seek ye therefore first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things shall be added unto you. Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. We begin with Ave Maria, family assistance. Ave Maria, grace of plenum Domus tecum. Benedicta tu regus. Benedictus fructus ventris tu Jesus. Seek ye therefore first the kingdom of God and His justice. In that seeking must come the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The renowned Father Faber, English oratorian, called the traditional Latin Mass the most beautiful thing this side of heaven. The true Mass is indeed beautiful because it is holy and a sacrifice, something which the lowest order Mass is not. 
Today we will examine why the true Mass has to be a sacrifice, and is properly called the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. As the author of the Latin Mass explained, teaches us, first of all, let's look at the significance of sacrifice. The word sacrifice is derived from, from the two Latin words, sacer, meaning sacred, and facere, to make. The words to sacrifice, as quite commonly used, mean to offer something valuable to a person as a token of affection for or dependence on that person. For example, if a father gives all he has to enable his children to receive a good education, and he himself lives in straitened circumstances, he is said to make a great sacrifice for his children. When a soldier leaves home and country to battle for the defense of his country at the risk of his life and limb, he is said to, make sac to sacrifice himself for his country. In a similar way, the young missionary priest who leaves his native land and encumbers at home to preach the gospel in foreign lands to hostile people is spoken of as making a great sacrifice. And rightly so, for when wealth and life and that which we hold dear are given for a noble purpose, they are rendered sacred. In the same sense, our offerings made to God may be called sacrifices. The poor widow in the gospel, who out of love of God cast into the treasury her last might, made a great sacrifice for God's sake. It is man's duty to honor his fellow men. Some among them, for example, parents, teachers, and superiors, must be honored in a special manner. This honor may be shown interiorly by respecting them, thinking well of them, but these sentiments are given outward expression, for example, by saluting them, speaking well of them, and thus we show them exterior honor by this way. But when we wish to honor a person in a particular manner, we offer him a gift or make him a present. Thus, in the days of feudalism, when the Lord visited his domains, the inhabitants offered him presents in order to testify that they acknowledged him as their master. They honored him as their Lord. But God is our supreme Lord. We belong to him with body and soul. We are subject to him in all things. Hence we must give greater honor to God than to all men. We must honor God interiorly by thinking reverently of him by submitting ourselves to him. And we honor must honor God externally by showing our reverence and submission outwardly. For example, by prayers, words, and so on. If we show respect even toward men, not only by word, but especially by visible gifts, how much more should we also honor by gifts God, who is the author of our being, to whom belong heaven and earth and all things. Let us now explain why sacrifice, or how sacrifice is, as a, is an act of divine worship. There is, however, a wide difference in the manner in which we offer a gift to man and to God. By offering gifts to men, we do not pay them the same honor which we pay to God. When we offer God a gift, we recognize him as our supreme master, to whom we belong entirely. We do him the greatest honor, we adore him. The gifts which we offer to men are simply presented, but the gifts which we offer to God are destroyed. The destruction of the object renders its recovery impossible. When of old, the Jews offered a lamb, they brought it to the temple. Then it was slaughtered by the priest, the blood was spilled, and the dead animal was burned. If the offerer had merely given the lamb, he would have declared only with such words, the lamb belongs to God, 
and not only the lamb, but all that I possess. I have from God, and I would give it to him if he desired it. On the other hand, by the killing and burning of the lamb, another sentiment is expressed. In other words, you could say, God is master over the life and death of this lamb, over the life and death of all creatures, and also over my life. I ought, properly speaking, to give up my life to God, but as God does not demand this, I now give him, instead of my life, the life of this lamb, and thus show that I am ready, if he so desires, to give up also my life for him. As the gifts or sacrifices which we offer to God confer the highest honor and are signs of adoration, such sacrifices can be offered only to God. Next, let us look at religious sacrifice, how it honors God as God. What then is a sacrifice in the sense of divine worship? A sacrifice is that highest act of religion in which a duly authorized person offers to God some sensible, that is, some perceptible to the senses, thing which is visibly immolated. Immolated means killed as a sacrificial victim, either physically or mystically, in acknowledgement of God's dominion over all things and of our total dependence on Him. That's a precise definition of sacrifice. He who sacrifices is called a priest. The sensible thing which is sacrificed is called the victim. The place where it is sacrificed is the altar. These four, priest, victim, altar, and sacrifice, are inseparable. Each one of them calls for the others. The intention of a sacrifice may be to give honor to God, to give thanks to Him, to ask a favor, or to make atonement. The offering of a sacrifice gives outward expression to the sentiments of the heart. The man who, who has a due knowledge of God will be filled with sentiments of respect, of gratitude, of confidence, and of contrition. Since it is part of man's nature to manifest outwardly what he feels inwardly, he will give expression to these sentiments by the offering of some object that he values. If he who offers a sacrifice has no other purpose than to honor God, we call this a sacrifice of praise and adoration. But if the, besides this object, he has the particular intention to thank God, he offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And when the offerer wishes anything particular from God, he offers a sacrifice of petition. And finally, if he wishes to pacify God, whom he has offended by sin, he offers a sacrifice of atonement and expiation or reparation. The man who believes in God understands perfectly that he is bound in conscience to spend his life in serving God. Even more, that God is worthy even to, the, to be honored by the sacrifice of his own life. Man gives expression to these sentiments of, of the heart by offering sacrifice. For the sacrifice of his own life, he substitutes the offering of other sensible objects. By destroying or otherwise changing them, he acknowledges by this destruction or change of sensible things that God is, in fact, sovereign master of life and death. Moore states that were God to require it, he would be willing even to sacrifice his own life in order thus to render him, that is God, an honor and homage of which he alone is worthy. Now let us explain why sacrifice answers the craving of human nature. <clears throat> sacrifice is the highest form of religious worship. 
It is the outward expression of man's entire dependence upon God. This absolute dependence of man upon his creator is expressed in the destruction or change of the thing offered. Without this destruction or change, it would seem that man did not fittingly express his interior acknowledgement that God was the sovereign master of life and death, and as such worthy even of being honored by the sacrifice of man's life were he to require it. Now man instinctively manifests his inward feelings by words and actions. The child, for example, already at a tender age, shows his attachment and affection for its mother by outward signs. The highest, holiest, noblest, strongest sentiments of the soul, conscious of its relations to God, are those of the supreme adoration due to him. Now the only outward sign which represents these sentiments of itself is sacrifice. Every other outward rite or act of religion may of itself be used to manifest the lower reverence paid to creatures as well as the highest worship, which is God's inalienable right. For example, we may bow, kneel, prostrate ourselves before creatures as the subject of the Orient does before the monarch's throne. We may burn incense as did the Jewish priests before the Ark of the Covenant or utter, the, quote, the harmony of sweet sounds in honor of the saints and angels. But take away sacrifice and religious worship has no outward sign which by itself expresses those high sentiments for the ruler of the universe, which are the most obligatory on mankind. Now let's go back in history. It's sacrificed before the time of Christ, particularly in the patriarchal age. It is natural for man to believe in a supreme being. It is also natural for him to express, to give expression to the sentiments entertained toward the ruler of the universe. Hence we find that the custom of offering sacrifice to the deity is as old as a human race. On the initial page of history, and in the Bible, as we read, how Cain and Abel, the sons of, the, of Adam, offered sacrifices to the Lord. The one offering the fruits of the field, the other immolating the firstlings of the flock. So also when the waters of the great flood had subsided, and Noah stopped, stepped forth from the ark, his first act was, what? To offer a holocaust to God in thanksgiving for his own and his family's preservation. And then later, later on, we see in the Bible, the sacrifices were offered by Abraham, Job, Melchizedek, and all religious-minded men who lived in the patriarchal age before the law of God was promulgated on Mount Sinai. Then we come to the pagans. The Gentile, the Gentile nations themselves, <clears throat> seated in the valley on the shade of death, did not lose every ray of the primal revelations and usages. With the notion of a supreme being, they preserved universally the practice of sacrifice, a fact which goes far to show that sacrifice was according to the heart of man's rational nature. Among all tribes and nations of whom history has left us any record, we find the two, we find the two mysterious institutions namely, sacrifice and priesthood. This is so universally true that the Greek historian Plutarch, who lived in the second century before Christ, did not hesitate to say the following words, you may find cities without walls, without literature, and without the arts and sciences of the civilized life, but you will never find a city without priests and altars, or which does not have sacrifices offered to the gods. That in itself should be a, a slap in the face of the Protestants who have no sacrifice. 
There is in man a religious instinct by reason of which he reaches out spontaneously in thought and affection to the God who made him. There is also within a man a natural tendency to express his religious sentiments by the sacrifice of something that is dear to him and thus show outwardly his total dependence on the author of his being. Sacrifice, therefore, was even under the law of nature and among the patriarchs from the beginning of the world, the essential form of religion. That these sacrifices were off when offered with the proper dispositions of the heart were agreeable to the Almighty, we may gather from Holy Scripture, which tells us that, quote, the Lord had respect to the offerings of Abel. Genesis 4.4. 4. From the very fact that God showed his pleasure in such sacrifices, we are natural led, naturally led to believe that he himself, that God himself had taught men, even from the beginning, to worship him in this manner. However, this original revelation concerning sacrifice, traces of which we found among all nations, became very much corrupted in the course of time. In order, therefore, to teach man how to worship properly, God chose a particular people to whom he gave express and minute directions about the sacrifices they were to offer. And this chosen people was the Hebrew nation. When God manifested himself amid thunder and lightning on Mount Sinai and delivered to Moses the written law engraved on Table, tablets of stone, he also prescribed the sacrifices which he was pleased to accept from the people of his choice. This is explained very well in the book of Numbers, chapter 28. Out of this nation, God chose a particular family, that of Aaron, to offer these sacrifices. These sacrifices were of various kinds. In some of them, the victim was partially consumed by fire and others entirely consumed by fire. God himself prescribed most minutely all the rites and ceremonies to be observed in that most solemn act of public worship. For example, look at the book of Leviticus, chapter 1, and so on, and following. Sacrifice was not only the essential worship of the entire nation, it was also the essential worship of each individual. Whenever an Israelite committed a sin, he was bound by the law of God to confess that sin and to offer sacrifice. The sinner led, the sinner led to the priest the animal destined for sacrifice. He then laid his hand upon the head of the victim in order to acknowledge before God that this innocent animal was intended to bear his sins and to die in his place. The animal was then slain by the priest and his blood was poured around about the altar. By this, the sinner acknowledged that God was, worsh was worthy to be honored by the sacrifice of his own life, especially after having offended him so grievously by his sin. And many and various as were those sacrifices comprising the fruits of the earth and the firstlings of the flocks, they all clustered around one which was par excellence, the sacrifice of the old law, namely the immolation of the Paschal Lamb, which commemorated the deliverance of, the Israel, of Israel's firstborn from the sword of the destroying angel in Egypt. Each every year, the tenth day of the first month, the head of each family was to procure a male lamb of that year, free from all blemish and def defect. Four days later, at the same hour in every house, the lamb was sacrificed with the greatest care, so that no bone was broken. Then it was roasted on a fire and served with, the, with unleavened bread. The Israelites were to eat it in haste, having their loins girt, shoes on their feet, 
and holding staves in their hands. For it was the phase, that is, the passing or Passover of the Lord. So, describe Exodus chapter 12. The sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb was not only was not only commemorative of the past deliverance, it also symbolized a future redemption. It was the type or prefigurement of another sacrifice in which the Immaculate Lamb of God was to be immolated on the altar of the cross for the redemption of the human race from the death of sin and for the deliverance of mankind from the yoke of Satan. Thus we have described now the need of a perpetual sacrifice. As sacrifice was instituted by God himself in the very beginning of the world for the most sacred ends, it was never to cease. The continual daily sacrifice ordained by God himself was kept up until the coming of the Redeemer. As long as the temple remained, the fire on the altar was never extinguished. This is described in Leviticus 6.13. The blood of victims never ceased to flow. The smoke of sacrifices went up continually to God as a testimony of the people's loyalty to him who said, quote, I am the Lord thy God. As a pledge of their hope in the Redeemer who would sacrifice himself for the sins of the world. Here then we have the cravings of our rational nature the morally universal practice of mankind and the sanction of God, all in favor of sacrifice. The number of those who abolish the sacrificial right, right weighs only as a little dust in the scale against the countless generations who have used it as the only adequate and worthy means of worshiping God. Now we come to the sacrifice of the cross. The sacrifice of the old law were only symbolic. As we said, sacrifices were offered to God at all times. On the very threshold of paradise, we see the smoke of sacrifice arising or set into heaven. Sacrifices were offered by all nations, as Plutarch has explained, as mentioned a few minutes ago, you will never find a city which has not sacrifices offered to the gods. Sacrifice was ordained by God himself. Bloody sacrifices were offered to keep before the mind of man remembrance of his dependence upon divine providence. Of sinfulness, the consequence of which he was deserving of death, and of the promise of Redeemer, who by the shedding of his blood was to atone for sin. The victim which was slain represented the sinner. By immolating the victim, the sinner publicly acknowledged that by his sins, he deserved death. The victim also represented the divine victim, who by his death would make satisfaction for his sin. These blood sacrifices served to prepare mankind for the better things, which would be revealed through the Redeemer. They were emblems or reminders of the future great sacrifice. We use the crucifix as a reminder of Christ's great sacrifice on the cross. It refers to a past event. The sacrifice offered before Christ came into the world were also figures or reminders of Christ crucified. They pointed in advance to his death. They showed men that he would come and die. From the sacrifice of Calvary, they derived all their merit. And to this, they gave way when that sacrifice became an accomplished fact on that first Good Friday, just as the shadows must fade and disappear with the rising of the sun before the radiance of the noonday sun. And because they were symbolic, they were abolished. A reason tells us that all the blood of sheep and oxen that was ever shed could not of itself render satisfaction to God for the sins committed by mankind. St. Paul explains in the Epistle to Hebrews 10 verse 4, For it is impossible 
that sin should be taken away with the blood of oxen and goats. <coughs> the blood of sinless animals could atone for sin only in as far as the sacrificing of these animals was ordained by God, represented the intentions of the human heart, and symbolized the precious blood of the promised Redeemer. When reality appeared, it put to flight the figure. The time came when the, when the many and varied sacrifices of the old law were no longer agreeable to God. Wherefore, when the anointed of the Lord came into the world, he dressed the God of his of hosts, quote, sacrifice and oblation, thou wouldst not, but a body thou hast fitted to me. Holocaust for sin did not please thee, then said I, Behold, I come to do thy will, O God, that thou mayest take away the first and establish that, will, that which followeth. Quotation from Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 9. This was as if he had said, I come to offer myself an acceptable sacrifice for the sins of the world. The prophetic rites and sacrifice of the old law were fulfilled by Christ's sacrifice on the cross. The prophecy of Malachi announcing the abolition of the Jewish sacrifice was fulfilled. Chapter 10, verse, verse chapter 1, verse 10, which says, I have no pleasure in you, in you, save the Lord of hosts, and I will not receive a gift of your hand. The sacrifice of the cross is indeed a true sacrifice. Why? Let me explain. The great sacrifice of the new law is the Son of God Himself, who by His death on the cross offered Himself to His Heavenly Father for our sins. St. Paul teaches that Christ offered Himself as a sacrifice on the cross, when in reference to the shedding of His blood, He says that Christ, quote, offered Himself unspotted unto God, Hebrews 9.14. Christ's death on the cross was in every sense a true sacrifice. Why? Because on the cross we find the essentials of a true sacrifice, which we mentioned earlier. Priest, victim, and immolation. Now this sacrifice, Christ is a priest because he offered it. He is a victim because he was offered and he immolates himself by freely delivering himself into the hands of his executioners. His will thus became operative in the external slain. Only this sacrifice properly honored God, the Son of God, he with whom God is well pleased. What did he offer? A gift truly worthy of God, a divine gift himself. In this sacrifice we see the redemption of man, reconciliation of earth with heaven. On Calvary, justice and mercy met and embraced. With this sacrifice, prophecies have passed away, but memorials begin. As the former look forward to Christ, so shall the latter look back to him. And now, as Hebrews 12, 10, 12 says, For this man offering one sacrifice for sins, forever sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, was all sacrifice to cease for the death of Christ, as we all know the Protestants believe in? The sacrifice of the new law is Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross offered himself to his heavenly Father for us. He offered his life in sacrifice by but once in this manner. This redeeming sacrifice was offered once, as Hebrews 9.28 says, Christ was offered once to exhaust sins of many. This redeeming sacrifice was not, is not, and cannot be repeated. Was this then the end of sacrifice? No, for in the new law there was to be a perpetual sacrifice. The offering of sacrifice is the best and most excellent manner of honoring God as we explained. If Christianity had no sacrifice, 
the Christian religion would be imperfect, where sacrifice is the only adequate, visible expression of that supreme adoration due to God. Christianity without sacrifice would be inferior in its worship to the patriarchal religion, the Old Testament. The perfect, sorry, the perfection of the Christian religion demands sacrifice. Christianity being perfect in, in all other respects must have an equally perfect external worship. It makes sense, doesn't it? But Christianity has the sacrifice of the cross. Does that not suffice? Yes, as a redeeming sacrifice, but not as a continuing sacrifice, unless we suppose it to be perpetuated. The cross is the atoning or redeeming sacrifice. And as such, it is as much the property of the Mosaic as of the Christian religion. But reason, human reason tells us that there must be a continual sacrifice. Christians must also have a substantial sign of the homage they owe and ought to pay to God, and which will last as long as religious worship of which it is perfection and the crown. If sacrifice were only useful as a price of a ransom from sin, then the one sacrifice once offered would suffice. Then there would be no necessity for continuing sacrifices. But sacrifice is useful and required for other purposes. To praise and adore God. To thank Him. To petition Him. To represent continually that which was once accomplished on the cross and to apply the fruits of it to our souls. Human reason demands a perpetual sacrifice for the perfection of Christian worship. Holy Scripture also speaks of a continuing sacrifice, which would apply individually to us the fruits of the redeeming sacrifice and would, in this sense, be its perpetuation. God foretold by the prophet Malachi that a true sacrifice was to be offered to him throughout the whole world. Quote, Malachi chapter 1, 10 to 11, I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, and I, and I will not receive a gift of your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even to the going down, my name is great among the Gentiles. And in, and in every place, even in his apartment, there is sacrifice. And there's offered to my name a clean oblation. End of quote. Except for the apartment edition. This oblation, <clears throat> which oblation definition is an offering, particularly the act by which the victim of sacrifice is offered to God, this oblation can only be the sacrifice of Christ. For only this is all pure and holy and pleasing to God. But is a prophesied sacrifice perhaps the sacrifice on the cross? No, for that was offered that for that was offered only in one place, on Mount Calvary, and only on one day, that first Good Friday. While the new sacrifice is to be offered in all places and at all times, if you heard the Holy Scripture. King David in his 109th Psalm, <clears throat> and St. Paul in the seventh chapter of the epistle, his epistle to the Hebrews, <clears throat> call Christ, quote, a priest forever, according to the order of the Gizidek. End of quote. Now these words indicate that Christ will always, to the end of the world, offer a sacrifice similar to the Gizidek's. Christ is called a priest. The chief office of a priest is what? Is to offer sacrifice. 
he is also called a priest forever. It is hereby shown that Christ will always offer a sacrifice. He is called a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. But an offering under the order of appearance of bread and wine was a characteristic of Melchizedek's priesthood, as described in Genesis chapter 14. Do these words refer to Christ's sacrifice on the cross? No. For there, for there he suffered but once. There he sacrificed in a bloody manner. Before the coming of the Redeemer, there existed two distinct kinds of sacrifice. The bloody, or the sacrifice of animals, and the unbloody, or the sacrifice of bread and wine, or the fruits of the earth. Christ offered himself under the appearances of bread and wine, according to Dwight of Melchizedek, at the Last Supper. On the following day, he offered himself in a bloody manner on Calvary. Thus did he, he unite the two kinds of sacrifice of the old law in the one adorable sacrifice of his body and blood, which he offered up on the appearances of bread and wine at the Last Supper. Therefore, Bearing in mind that the offering of sacrifice is dictated by man's very nature and that by divine ordinance, the sacrifices of the old law were to be abolished and were to be succeeded by the oblation of a clean, pure, and sinless victim in every place, from the rising of the sun even to the going down. We necessarily conclude that the Christian religion, which is but completion, and perfection of all true religion that existed before Christ must also have its sacrifice wherein there is immolated a victim that is dear to man and acceptable to God. In closing, using the words of the Sacred Council of, of Trent, this, that is the Mass, in fine, is that oblation which was prefigured by various types of sacrifices during a period of nature and of the law, inasmuch as it comprises all the good things signified by those sacrifices as being the consummation and perfection of them all. End of quote. Session 22, Chapter 1 of the Council of Trent. Mary, pray for us. Amen. May the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.